All right, well, if you have your Bibles, open up to Jonah. We are in week two of five weeks going through the small but significant story of the prophet Jonah. Now, the story of Jonah is more than just Jonah and the whale, as you have probably heard uh, mostly about it. As as I hope you saw last week, and we're going to continue to see this week, what an amazing story, and ultimately, what an amazing God who is in pursuit of Jonah. And we're going to see that today. So before we get into it, let me pray for us, and we will uh, get into the scriptures. Lord Jesus, thank you so much again for bringing us here this morning to hear from you, to experience your presence through your word, your Holy Spirit. God, we love you. May we continue to cherish you more and more and deeper and deeper every day. So turn our hearts completely, wholeheartedly to you through your word today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I think one of the most sweetest and just special moments in a marriage where you really express how much you love each other is when you're driving in a car together and you're lost. (laughs) Amen? It's just such a sweet moment, you know, where you just express your love for one another, and and now I now if you're if you're like me, I never get lost when I'm driving, um, or at least I don't admit that I do. Right? See, people say that men we have a problem admitting when we're lost with directions, but you know I think women have a problem with admitting they're wrong too uh, when they're driving. But anyways, that's another story. So here's the thing: when you're driving somewhere and you're going obviously the wrong direction, and you know it. Right, And your spouse is, again, gently encouraging you to do a U-turn, right? To turn around, to get right back on track and turn the GPS on, right? As your spouse is encouraging you to do that, why is it so difficult for us to admit that we're wrong? Why is it so hard for us to admit that we're driving in the wrong direction? Well, it's really a simple answer. It's pride, right? I mean, we're just prideful to the core, men and women, all of us together, right? We're prideful human beings. And so it's hard for us to admit that we're wrong when we're so convinced that we're right, right? Well, I think what we see in Jonah, especially in the snippet of the story today that we're going to cover, is a man who was so convinced that he was heading in the right direction, that he had completely tuned out all the signs around him, the voice of God himself, rebuking him, correcting him, asking him to please do a U-turn and get right back on the path, the true path. You see, Jonah is lost. He's going in the wrong direction. And the only way forward for his life is to, com- is to make a U-turn, to completely turn around. But will he do that? You know, last week as we began this study, we saw that the major theme of Jonah, it's this. It's our responsibility to reflect God's compassion for those who don't know him, the lost, we say. So here's what we saw last week. Just in the first three verses of Jonah, God called Jonah to join him in his mission to rescue the Assyrians living in Nineveh from their sin to preach salvation to them. But Jonah didn't want to do that. He didn't like the Assyrians. He had an us versus them mentality. He had some racial prejudices. He was discriminatory against them because they were an enemy of Israel. He didn't want anything to do with them. He didn't want them to experience God's grace. He wanted them to only experience God's judgment and wrath. So he deliberately disobeyed God's word and did not go to Nineveh. As we saw last week, right, he escaped, so to speak. He tried to run away from the presence of the Lord, the text tells us in the first three verses. So he goes and travels to the Mediterranean coast, the far east side of the Mediterranean, uh, Joppa. He finds a ship there going to Tarshish, which is probably in Spain, which at the time would have been the farthest known point in the world. In other words, the literal end of the earth is what they thought. And so Jonah is making his way to the edge of the earth, to the end of the Mediterranean. And so he's traveling on this ship 
trying to hide from God, convinced that he is going in the right direction, that he's doing the right thing. But is it even possible to hide from God? And is God going to let Jonah go? That's where we pick up in verse 4. We're going to cover verses 4 through 17 this morning. So I want us to read through this part of the story, which is filled with excitement and drama. And then we're going to talk about it uh, and make some points at the end. So let's start in verse 4. So Jonah's on the ship, and here's what we see. In the, in the Mediterranean Sea. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. So notice the first few words there. Who did this? Who, who did this? Who caused the storm? The Lord. The Lord hurled, right? He literally threw the wind onto the sea. A storm comes up very quickly, so severe that the ship itself is in danger. Verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. Now, this tells you how serious this storm was if these experienced sailors who do this for a living are terrified. They're afraid of this storm, so it's a bad one. And so what do they start doing? They start praying to their gods, plural, so they have belief here in more than one God, whichever one will listen, whichever one will work and calm this storm is the one they're praying to or hoping will respond. Look, we continue verse five. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. So again, this speaks to the seriousness of this storm, this violent windstorm on the ocean. It has become so bad, they're willing to throw the cargo, which is how they make money. They're throwing their livelihood overboard to try to save themselves. It's that bad. But, look at this, continuing in verse 5. Jonah, what was he doing? Helping them? Praying to God to calm the storm? No, Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. What? Now, Maybe you're like me and you could sleep through a hurricane or a freight train or anything that's very loud, right? But Jonah here, what in the world, how could he possibly sleep through this? Verse 6, so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. So the captain comes to Jonah Again, they're just looking for whatever works at this point, implying that the other, guard, the other gods apparently aren't listening. They're not responding to the cries for help, so he says, well, hey, what about this guy who's asleep and doesn't seem to care? Let's ask him. Verse 7, and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. This was an ancient kind of superstitious thing they would do. They would cast lots and whichever it fell on, that was the problem, right? And so now notice here though, we already see that God has caused the storm. He hurled the wind upon the sea. Who do you think is the one causing the lot to fall on Jonah? God is in control. Verse eight, then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Verse 11, then they said to him, well, what, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous, he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now we don't know if Jonah was trying to be some kind of sacrificial hero here or if he was so burdened with guilt that he was essentially 
on the brink of suicide. He was willing to die in this moment. Either way, this is a terrible and tragic circumstance. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. So they don't want to throw Jonah overboard. They don't want to believe that perhaps he really is the problem. And so they're trying to save him and themselves, trying to get back to the shore. Continuing verse 13, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Again, who is causing this storm to become so violent? Verse 14, therefore they called out to not one of their gods, but the Lord. And when you see Lord, L-O-R-D in all caps in the ESV, that means Yahweh, the personal name of the Israeli God, the one true God of the Bible who we worship. That was his personal name. And so they're calling out now in a personal way to him, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So these pagan sailors who worship multiple gods all of a sudden are getting in tune. They're realizing that there must be a one true God who controls the wind and the sea, the lots that fall as they may. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. We're going to stop right there for now. You see, one thing is apparent in this tragic story where up to this point, we have to assume that Jonah has lost his life. That Jonah drowns in the ocean. But the storm stops just as Jonah said it would. And so the one apparent truth here is that Jonah nor the sailors are in control. God is in control of this whole situation. He created this circumstance. He made the lots fail where they may so that Jonah would be pointed out as the true sinful problem who must die so the others may be saved. God is the one in control here. Jonah and the sailors both think that they are heading in the right direction, going about their business and their normal everyday lives, but God has other plans for the sailors and for Jonah. Why? Because, and if you have your scripture journal, write this down. This is the main point of the sermon today. God is determined to save the lost and sanctify the saved. That's the main point of this story today. That is what we see clearer than anything else, that our God is determined to pursue those who do not know him, in other words, the sailors, and he is determined to continue to shape and mold his people into who they need to be, aka Jonah in this story. The amazing thing is that in this storm, God is accomplishing both of those things at the same time. He is opening the eyes of the hearts of these sailors who start out praying to multiple gods. And how does this part of the story end? With them praying and worshiping and making vows, commitments to the one true God. Do you see that? At the same time that's happening, God is changing Jonah's heart. Now, we don't see the evidence of that quite yet. But here's what we know. God is determined to save the lost and sanctify the saved, number one, by using all circumstances to advance his mission. That's the first big thing we see here. God is going to shape you as his child into who he wants you to be through every circumstance in your life so that you may reflect the compassion for those who don't know him as he does. You see, when Jonah boards this ship, he thinks he is good to go. He's got a great runaway plan. He is running away from home, so to speak. He has got his bags packed. He's got his one-way ticket punched. 
He is good to go to the other opposite end of the Mediterranean Sea on the coast of Spain, but God has something to say first. God is not finished with Jonah. What about the sailors? When these sailors weigh anchor and set sail, they think everything is fine and they're going about their normal everyday business of shipping cargo to the other side of the sea, making lots of money as they go about that. Jonah and the sailors both are moving along with life and what they think is the right direction, what they believe is the right path for them, everything is going as they want planned and then what happens? The Lord hurls a wind upon the sea. God intervenes and messes up their plans. Was that cruel of God? Is that wrong of God to interfere like this? What's the purpose and point of this storm? You see, everything was going well for, from Jonah and the sailor's viewpoint. And then God shows up and directs them off the course they wanted to go. He diverts their attention to what's really important. Jonah has this dream getaway where he's going to live on the coast of Spain, right? And he's just going to have a nice, you know, uh, whatever life where he's just living there and enjoying the ocean and the waves and the sandy beaches and whatever else. That's his dream vacation that's turning permanent in his mind. But God interrupts. The sailors have this livelihood. They have this business. They have to continue. But God interrupts. God sends this storm to purposefully and literally wake them up. To wake Jonah up. To change the direction of his heart. To show him that the path he, on, the path he is on does not lead to life. It is going to lead him to destruction. At the same time, he sends the storm to redirect the allegiance of these sailors from their false idols. Their idols of wealth, success, comfort through their business. These gods that they're praying to, the Lord is going to wake them up and turn their hearts to faith in him. So what does all of that tell us about God? That he is willing to intervene that he is willing to send what seems to be something terrible in our lives that is actually meant to rescue us, to change our direction on the path that is leading us to destruction. It tells us that God is determined to pursue those who don't belong to him, to bring them to saving faith in his name. It tells us that God is determined to bring back those who do belong to him, but have wandered off the path in some kind of of habitual disobedience and sin. You see, God sends this terrible and frightening storm not, not to punish Jonah, understand, but to rescue him. Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 11, as Thad read for us during worship, say, verse 6, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Verse 11 tells us, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Notice again in these verses, what are we seeing? Verse 4, the Lord hurled the wind. Verse 7, the lot fell on Jonah. Verse 13, the sea grew more and more dangerous. None of this is pleasant in the moment. None of this is something that any of these people on that ship would have welcomed or invited into their lives in that moment. However, as unpleasant as it is, it is all for good. It is all for the good purposes of God in which they cannot see. All of this was an act of grace. It was an act of mercy to Jonah and these sailors. You see, God's plans and his mission will never fail. And so sometimes God will send a storm into our lives to very much wake us up to the reality that we are on the wrong path, that we have gotten so far off, lost at sea, if you will, in our sin and in our shame that he has to come in and say, Andrew, you've got to wake up. This is not working out. Do you understand? You are going to make a mess of your life. And God comes to us 
And in those dark moments that we would find unpleasant, it is actually the hand of his love that is bringing his children back on course and saying, I have a better way for you. It's hard to see the goodness of God in the middle of our storms, but we know that a trustworthy God can be trusted. He is infinitely good. He is infinitely powerful. He is infinitely wise. As the author Jerry Bridges once said, if he's not all three of those things, then he wouldn't be trustworthy. But he is. He is infinitely trustworthy because he knows all things. He has the power to accomplish all things. And he loves you. That is a trustworthy God. He's shaping Jonah. He's bringing him to repent of his sin and turn back to the God he loves. You know, when my kids are sick and they don't want to take their medicine, let me tell you, we're, every time it's like the brink of World War III. There is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is terrible, right? It tastes so bad, right? It's okay. It's good for you. It's going to make you better. You have to take this medicine so that you will feel better, so that you will have healing. And man, I think we look at the circumstances in our lives and we're so quick, we're so quick to complain instead of pausing and thinking through the situation. What is God really trying to show me right now? As unpleasant as this is, if I could wave a magic wand and it all disappear, I would. But is God speaking to me? Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 tells us, Paul said to the Philippian church, he said, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will, not might, not maybe if he gets around to it, not, well, if he can convince himself that he loves you enough, will, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What that means is that if you belong to Christ, if you have given your heart and faith to Lord Jesus Christ, then he is not going to fail in shaping you into the person he created you to be. He is not going to fail in bringing you to an eternal home in heaven one day. He will accomplish what he has started in your heart. And that word sanctification, it means that that is going to take the course of your life. It is not going to happen overnight. But through every little circumstance, good and bad, our God is present and he is shaping and molding you into the person you need to be for your good and his glory. I think Philippians 1 6 is one of the most comforting truths there is in all of Scripture. God is determined to save the lost and sanctify the saved in every circumstance. Not just that, but number two, even when we don't seem to care. Boy, do we sure make things a lot harder than they have to be by living in disobedience outside of God's purposes and his design for our lives. I mean, that's really the crux of sin, right? At the heart of the issue of sin is that we are operating, or at least trying, to operate our lives outside of God's good design, his good intentions, his good boundaries for us. We look at the scriptures, we look at God's commands, and we say, eh, that's restraining, I'm going to go have more fun and do my own thing. Eh, that's too serious. I don't want to take life that serious. We look at God's commands, we look at the scriptures, and we look at the teachings of Jesus, and we say, that requires too much effort, too much work. I don't really want to sacrifice my time and energy and finances and resources to love others and support them. I'm too busy building my own kingdom. You see, all of this, all of that mindset is self centered and it is us trying to live outside of God's actual design for the way he created reality so yeah you're kind of living in this augmented reality when you are living outside of the plan and purposes of God for your life so Jonah is doing just that 
He is living in deliberate disobedience to God's word and God's plans. Jonah is so upset with God wanting to save his enemies, right, that he is now trying to literally run away from the presence of God. Jonah just seems to not even care anymore about the salvation of anybody or maybe even himself. You see, what we see happening in Jonah's heart is very disturbing. You know, the way the author of of this short book here tells us, tells us that Jonah went down to Joppa and then went down into the ship and then had gone down into the inner part of the ship to sleep. See, that language is intentional. That language is telling us what actually happened, but also symbolic of Jonah's heart. He is descending deeper and deeper into the darkness and the destructiveness of sin. The fact that he was fast asleep during that storm definitely has cause for alarm. I mean, was Jonah so at peace with his actions that he could lay down and go to sleep in the middle of this terrible storm that even experienced sailors were afraid of? Did he, was he so convinced that he was on the right road following his own directions that he was actually at peace with himself and could lay down and sleep? Listen, some things should keep you awake, right? A guilty conscience, crying kids, snoring spouse, right? I mean, these are things that are just normal things that should probably keep you awake, right? We had one of those last night. The crying kid part. All right. (laughs) But I don't think, I don't think Jonah had any of those present with him. And that is what's scary. It appears Jonah has developed a callous heart. His heart is just slowly, not overnight. This is the pattern of sin. It tricks you, it tempts you, it gets you to do something, and then it's easier to do it the next time. And over time, callousness starts to form around your heart to the Word of God, to the influence of Christians in your life, to prayer with the Lord. Callousness. It becomes harder and harder for you to feel the presence of God in your life. Maybe that's why Jonah thought he could run away from it. He wasn't feeling it to begin with because the sin in his heart had caused him to say, I am okay without God. I am doing just fine. So he is completely ignoring the needs of others in the ship. He's completely ignoring the needs of the Lord's mission for him. Man, what a dangerous place to be. What a dangerous place, spiritually speaking, for us to reside. When we think that we have got life so figured out that we can ignore the needs of those perishing around us, that we can sleep through the storm in which God is trying to wake us up. We must not resist the goodness of God. We can't resist the goodness of God for something better. Something better, we think, in this world. How easily do we settle for less than what God has for us. How easily does Jonah and these sailors settle for the things of the world that promise to give them success, security, love, and a great vacation, perhaps? How easily do we settle for the things of this world and reject and ignore the true needs of others around us and the mission of God before us? God is telling us to wake up. Our world today does not need Christians with callous hearts. Our world today needs Christians who are armed and ready to go in spiritual warfare, in battle for the truth of Jesus Christ, starting in our own hearts, flowing out of our own hearts into our own homes, flowing out of our own homes into society. But you see where it starts It doesn't start with us pointing our fingers at society. It starts with us looking in the mirror. Jonah's struggle with God 
is a bad witness to others. When the sailors ask him who he is and where he comes from, look at his answer again in verse 9. Look at that. He says, well, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Well, good job, Jonah. Those are great Sunday school textbook answers. I'm glad you know who made the seas and the dry land. But look at your life. Oh boy, that's great. Good for you, church-going person. You know all the right things to say. You know all the truth to post on Facebook. That's wonderful. But look at the way you are living your life. Look at the way you speak to your spouse and your children. Look at the way you spend your time or neglect to spend your time with the Word of God every week, with prayer, with people who belong in the family of God with you. Look at the ways we choose to let callousness rule instead of the grace of God that transforms us. What a show Jonah was putting on. His answer didn't carry much weight because he's living in sin. And I think the sailors who worshiped other gods, I think they could see straight through that and see his hypocrisy. Sometimes the best thing for us is for God to shake us free from our apathy. We need to realize God is determined to save the lost and sanctify us, not just when it seems that we don't care, but number three, and lastly, in a world desperate for truth and meaning. God is pursuing those who don't know him in this world that is so hungry for meaning and purpose to be attributed to their hearts and their lives. I want us to end today by thinking about these sailors. You know, these sailors were pagans. In other words, they did not worship the one true God. They obviously worshiped multiple gods, so they were polytheistic and pluralistic, open to many different types of beliefs. It appears that they were willing to come to any God that would do the trick. In fact, look back at Jonah 1 verse 6. The captain comes to Jonah, and what does he say? He says, call out to your God. Perhaps... He will be the one who can wave his magic wand and fix this. You see, these sailors in the ancient world were open to whatever God, so to speak, worked as long as he saved their lives, as long as he made their circumstances better, as long as he gave them what they wanted. That is the God in which they would worship. Sound familiar? What's very interesting is we see here that their beliefs have snippets of truth. You know, their emotions, their needs are no different than the basic human experience. Here's what I mean. These sailors obviously feared death just like any other human and they were willing to even throw away their livelihood, that cargo, that precious cargo overboard to save themselves. They also valued compassion. I mean, we see this because they try to row back to shore and don't immediately throw Jonah into the sea. They weren't savages. They didn't want to throw Jonah overboard like he told them to do. They tried to save his life. These pagan sailors who didn't worship God valued compassion. They valued justice. They valued love in this way. They care more about Jonah than the prophet of God Jonah cared about the Assyrians. They believe in the concept of good and evil, which is why they cast lots to determine who brought this evil upon them, they say. They obviously believe in some kind of divine judgment and power. They acknowledge that a God of some kind has power to stop this. They even acknowledge and realize that someone must absorb judgment for them to be saved. What must we do to you, Jonah, so that we may be saved from this? You see, at the beginning of this trip, These sailors didn't acknowledge the God of Israel as the one true God, so they were truly lost in their sin. However, they were hungry for truth. Do you see that? They wanted the same things that all humans ultimately crave because God created us that way. We all want justice in this world. We all believe in some kind of higher power, even if we suppress that truth. We all believe that There must be judgment done and absorbed for others to be set free. 
You see, today's world, we live in a very similar context, even in this ancient story. In many ways in our society, those who don't know Christ, they value compassion just like those sailors. They want justice, even if it's misdirected. They do believe in that higher power. There's many gods in our world today, in our culture today. There are people everywhere around you at your job and in your neighborhood that truly value these things and they are desperately searching for truth and meaning and purpose in their lives. But what are we telling them? How are we living any differently than them? Are we in the same boat as them, running away from the presence of God? Like Jonah, do we just not seem to care? Are we fast asleep, sleeping through the storm of their spiritual lostness, ignoring the fact that they are perishing and on their way to eternal damnation without God forever, without Jesus in their lives? Do we reflect the compassion of God truly for the lost people that he has put in our lives to be a witness to? Do we know all the right words like Jonah, but they can spot our hypocrisy from a mile away? Are we so consumed with our own story that we forget that God's story includes them? J.D. Greer in his Bible study on the book of Jonah says this, how does the realization, how does the realization that your story is about God and others, not just you, change how you perceive your life situation right now? And think about that. What a great way to think about our lives. You know, it's so easy for us to, to play things in our lives and rehearse things in our head, uh, uh, past events that have happened to us. And, you know, maybe sometimes you just daydream that, you know, man, maybe, maybe I will finally get famous one day and, and I'll, you know, write that hit song or I'll write that award-winning novel or I'll, you know, win the lottery or whatever and buy a baseball team, whatever. Maybe you daydream about how you could become famous one day and maybe there'd be a biography written about you. Maybe there'd be a movie about your life. And so you think of all the cool soundtrack songs that would be on your movie, right? It's so easy for us to be narcissistic and self-absorbed with our own life and our own story that we forget that our story is not even really about us. At least it shouldn't be. We forget that God has put other characters, if you will, other people created in his image that he loves deeply in your life for you to join them in the story of God. Not, for, not to make them and manipulate them to orbit around your story as some kind of side character, but to join them together equally in the mission of God. It's so sad that we sleep like Jonah through the storm. Spiritual lostness around us. We need to know and the world needs to know but yes, there is hope. That's what those sailors needed to know. And God's the one who opened their eyes in spite of Jonah's disobedience to be a faithful witness to them. There is hope for real meaning and purpose in our lives because it's very simple. Someone greater than Jonah has come. You see, many years later after this ancient story with Jonah asleep in the boat, there would be another man asleep in a boat during a storm who sometime after that there would be lots cast for him for his clothes as he was being crucified but not because he was the one with sin in his life like Jonah. You see at every turn in this story today we see God ultimately in control. Even in spite of the sin of others he was accomplishing salvation in the midst of the storm and in a very similar way, at every turn in the story of Jesus' life, his arrest, his trial, his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection, we see God in control, even in spite of the sin of others. He was accomplishing salvation in the midst of that storm. And think of this, for the sea to be calmed, and the sailors to be saved, what had to happen? 
that day, that fateful day on the Mediterranean Sea so long ago in 700s BC. Someone had to be thrown into the sea for others to be saved. Someone had to be thrown and sacrificed into the storm so that others could live. Likewise, for the storm of sin to be calmed in our hearts and for us to be saved, Jesus had to be thrown into the sea and storm of sin and evil and absorb it upon himself so that you and I wouldn't have to. You see, the story of Jonah points us to Jesus. It shows us that no matter what we think is the right direction, no matter what we think will provide security and happiness and joy and peace in our lives, nothing touches the loving grace of God. Nothing can compare to the fact that we serve a God who loves us through every storm, yet, in fact, uses every storm to display his love for us, as unpleasant as it may be at times. You see, the difference is when Jonah was cast overboard, he didn't die. But Jesus really did, providing a true and permanent sacrifice in our place and payment for our sin. By the way, what happened to Jonah? Let's finish this little part of the story, verse 17. We're going to start here next week. Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, not punishing him, rescuing him. Matthew 12, 40, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, punishing him so that you wouldn't have to be. Jesus is the true sacrificial substitute who lives, who raised from this grave. This message, this gospel is the only hope for us and for this world So what about you today? Maybe you are like these sailors and you value truth and justice and compassion and you would consider yourself a good moral person, but you have to realize that there is great divide between you and the one true God. You have to turn away from any other God that you have devoted yourself to and turn to the only one who can save you, who can be your substitute and calm the storm of sin in your heart. Maybe you do have a relationship with Jesus and you're here today, but you are living like Jonah. Are you living in any unrepentant sin? And are you fast asleep through the lostness around you, oblivious to the needs of others around you? While others are perishing without Christ, may we wake up from daydreaming in our own little worlds. There are people in our lives who are hungry for purpose and meaning. If God is sending us a wake-up call, if he's sending you a wake-up call right now, like he was Jonah, do not miss that call. Respond. Confess your sin. Confess your apathy. Confess where you have neglected to share the gospel with someone or to show the love of Christ to someone. And ask the Lord to help you do a U-turn. Do not resist his loving grace and his, cor- and his correction. You know, this could be true of any of us today and probably is to some degree. So if you need to talk with someone after the service, I'll be available in the cafe. I'd love for you to come by and we can talk about this. We can talk about the U-turn that God wants to do in your life. You can find one of our staff members or one of our team outside and they can help direct you in the right direction for that. But may we all turn to Jesus and find his path is truly the one true way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this word in Jonah and this story that ultimately points us to you. Lord, we need a sacrificial substitute to be thrown into the storm so that we may not perish. Jesus, that was you. It is you. And so, Lord, if there's anyone in here today that has not truly 
turned off the path of sin and turned to you for salvation. Lord, would you open their hearts? Maybe they're like the sailors and they've been just devoting themselves to whatever God in their life works. Whatever idol, whatever thing this world has to offer that makes them happy, whatever works, Lord, turn their hearts to you. Lord, for those of us who do belong to you, but have grown callous in our vision of those around us, our perception of the needs of this world, the need for the gospel to take root in the people's lives around us that you've given to us to help, to help rescue them. God, forgive us. Have mercy on us for sleeping through the storm. Wake us up. Lord Jesus, wake us up. May we be found faithful, obedient. Lord, as you are determined to save and sanctify us, may we be determined to show that same love and compassion to others. Lord Jesus, would you help us with this as we leave this place today? It's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.